I think a materialist approach to things is very, very consistent with uh, my experience in Christian social justice. I feel like the, the deeper I get into anarchist practice, the deeper my faith is getting at the same time. I would hope that you know, securing means of life for all would be something all people of faith would say, oh yes, that's at the basis of what we believe. And those who are most marginalized know the most about the truth, the good and the beautiful. To me, it's less that I think building class solidarity is a bad thing, as much as it seems like if you don't attend to things like anti-black racism, um, that's always going to get in the way of building class solidarity, actually. And when you go back, you find that a lot of uh, revolutionary grassroots participatory movements, the, the precursors to what you could call um, the barrio assemblies and these like, you know, grassroots neighborhood organizations, a lot of these were sponsored by the church. What does it mean to say that the Christian tradition is internally contradictory and there are antagonisms there? Um, you're always uh, being faithful to some aspects and betraying other aspects. Welcome to the Magnificast, the podcast about Christianity and leftist politics. I'm Dean Detloff. I'm a PhD student at the Institute for Christian Studies in Toronto. And I'm Matt Bernico. I teach media studies at Greenville University in Greenville, Illinois. This is our 99th episode, so we're getting up there. We're about to go into the triple digits next week. But before we do, we thought we'd take it kind of easy right before we turn 100, our centenary episode, if you will. Uh, and talk a little bit about this really lovely trip that Dorothy Day took to Cuba one time. <laughs> and she wrote a bunch about it uh, in this great like travel blog before they were travel blogs um, in a column to the Catholic Worker newspaper. So we're going to get into that in a second and just talk about all the great times that she had. But before we do, uh, we're just going to talk about some other stuff that's going on. Um, the first one is a little more serious, but pretty related. So people might remember back in episode 45, we talked to Brenna Cusson and Joe Cruz about the Catholic worker. Um, Brenna Cusson got arrested just recently. She and some other comrades were, uh, turning a valve to stop some oil flow in Minnesota and they got arrested and it is bad news um they've been in jail over the weekend we don't really know what the situation will be like on friday i guess but be on the lookout for that brenna is a friend of our show anyway and a really neat person doing a lot of really cool stuff and she helped us kind of think through a lot of things with regard to the catholic worker too so keep her in your prayers and if you have time i guess or um any ways that you could think of to support her, um, please do that. And we'll be trying to send out different ways of supporting her and her comrades as well on the internet too. So keep an eye out for that. Cool. Um, well, in light of that very serious news, uh, you still have time to send in your uh, theology questions for us to answer very poorly in episode 100. I'm really looking forward to that segment. It's going to be really, really weird. Uh, so do it. Uh, send us all your hard <laughs> theology questions. So far, we've gotten a lot of them. Uh, the thing about the theology questions we've received so far is that I think that we can actually answer the ones that we've got. So, um, you know, a few of them, a few of them, some of them, not so much. Uh, but, you know, <laughs> give us your hard ones. Ask us the big questions that you that your youth pastor just was not equipped to answer. And uh, we, uh, your Internet youth pastors, will definitely be able to help you out there. Uh, here's one. I'll, I'll, I'm going to toss one over to you. Just point blank. Oh, uh, this well, is completely not rehearsed. Yeah, just a really classic theology question. How many angels? could fit on the top of a pin uh let's see um so if i remember correctly uh angels are remarkably small so um yeah that's pretty close except unless you just had one very big large angel so it's either a lot of very small angels or one big one huh yeah well, those are the only two right answers <laughs> so yeah i remember that in the summa theologica um it's in there <laughs> Yeah, so that's the kind of hard-hitting uh, theological journalism we're doing here at the Magnificast. Just a lot of really good research on the questions that you sent us, uh, so feel free to send us some more. Cool. Um, other things you should send us are iTunes reviews. Um, we haven't really been reading the iTunes reviews lately because I uh, haven't gotten them, so um, you should get back on that. We've got two this week. I'm only going to read one of them. Uh, one is uh, one of the iTunes reviews that we've received is sort of criticism uh, with regards to the episode in Venezuela we did. And since I'm a communist, I'm going to suppress that view and ignore it. And I'm going to read this other one instead. <laughs> uh, <laughs> what's up? <laughs> Just like Maduro. <laughs> exactly. Um, <laughs> this is, sorry, we take your criticism, but um, just not going to read it. Anyways, 
Uh, this one person <laughs> writes, I started this podcast in the last week of June with episode one. Now I'm... Wow. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. We've taken down episode one because it's too, it's too much. Um... Anyways, they said that they love that sweet shirt, and I can't, uh, I can't wear it to church slash work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fair enough. The sleep shirt, in other words. <laughs> yeah, NSFW. Uh, thanks for having fun and interesting conversations about Jesus and loving people. I'd love some episodes on theory slash philosophy. Maybe something about Nietzsche, Derrida, and Foucault. Oh. Huh. Well, why in chat? We do know a few things about those yeah. French boys and that German... Boy. Why, why did why didn't someone ask sooner? I would have loved to talk about those guys. Um, oh, they also want to know how they relate to Jesus. I couldn't tell you about that part. <laughs> um, nope. <laughs> hashtag remember the orb episode. Hashtag thanks for fixing those audio problems. Hashtag kill your masters. <laughs> there you go. Damn the the orb episode though is exactly oof. It's so good. That's episode two. It's a lot of good hashtags. Three. I don't remember. Uh, I think it's a point five. Oh man, love that. <laughs> Love that numbering scheme. Yeah. yeah, it's like the Lion King one and a half took a page out of that one. Yeah, well, Hakuna Matata, let's talk about Nietzsche sometime. That'd be fun. <laughs> I think that is actually uh, a phrase attributed to Nietzsche. Yeah, he de- uh, Nietzsche's known for saying Hakuna Matata. Um, yeah, it's in his book, uh, Why I Am So Chill. <laughs> yeah, that's right. In Foucault, he loved eating grubs. That was his thing. He was the sort he of... He was a grubby guy. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Discipline and grubbish. <laughs> All right. All right. All right. <laughs> uh, okay. So we do need to address the one other big political thing that's happened this week. It's really important uh, to talk about this, to kind of be informed citizens and make sure that we all kind of uh, know what's happening in um, the imperialist country of the United States of America. There was a state of the union. Uh, so Dean, did you watch it? I did not watch it. No. Oh man. Did you watch it? Yeah, I watched it. You missed a lot of good stuff. Um, there's this really weird part in the State of the Union um, where for about an hour and a half, it was just like Trump silently shaking everyone's hands and invite, and like welcoming them to the State of the Union. Uh, yeah, well, that, I mean, that's just why I skipped it. It's that way every year. And it's like once you've seen one, you've seen them all, you know? Yeah, it's weird. Also, Trump had these really big, just giant shoes on, and he didn't talk about them at all, but uh, he had them on. It was pretty wild. Yeah, I did hear that one thing, though, where uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, when came uh, her time to do the traditional handshake, uh, she gave him one of those hand buzzers. And I appreciate <laughs> that. I just like that that good social humor. Yeah, that's right. That's what happened. Uh, Nancy Pelosi had one of those big uh, flowers on her shirt that squirts water in your face. Ah, uh, yeah, that's not what you want when Trump's got that floppy toupee. <laughs> oh, man, the joke here is that they're all clowns. What's up? All right, this part of the podcast <laughs> is done now. <laughs> <laughs> cool so let's talk about Dorothy that's the state of the union <laughs> <laughs> that's the state of the union though it's one big it's one big circus hi this is our uh this is our hot take in your local newspaper <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's right clowning around with matt and dean <laughs> yeah um hey uh speaking of clowning around though dorothy day did some real clown around in cuba in 1962 <laughs> And we know all about it because she wrote these really nice and lovely little like uh, notes about her trip <laughs> in the Catholic Worker. Um, okay, so like Dean said at the top of the episode, if you don't know who Dorothy Day is, you should stop and take a second and figure it out. Um, just do a quick Google uh, about who she is, read some stuff in the Catholic Worker, go back and listen to episode 45, Catholic Work in It, and find out some more about Dorothy Day. Uh, she was a real cool person. I don't know. I feel like everyone probably knows who she is, though, right? She's kind of like the gateway drug I'll, I'll to give you Christian a- leftism. Yeah, that's true. I'll give you a quick summation because I actually just lectured about her last Saturday. <laughs> uh, but uh, here's the short of it. So she grew up in Episcopal, and then uh, she hung around with a bunch of communists. And then to make a really long story short, she turned Catholic. She went down the Catholic road, and she stopped being a communist, but not completely. Uh, she was like still very good friends with them. She helped found, uh, not by herself, but helped found the Catholic Worker, a really interesting kind of social and ecclesial experiment and she is like maybe going to be a saint in the catholic church but she's a fascinating person because she has a lot of sympathy for communists having actually known a ton of them and uh is also known for not really getting like stuck in one box she's sort of a moving target uh ideologically and um i think these uh these reflections on cuba are really fascinating because basically like dorothy day kind of has a reputation for being uh really suspicious of state power and other kinds of power and people like to view her as a sort of thoroughgoing anarchist type 
But in these reflections, she seems to have a kind of interesting nuanced perspective on the possibility of state socialism and uh, revolution and it messes with some ideas she has about pacifism and all that kind of stuff. So anyway, um, you should definitely go look at, at Dorothy Day, but the short of it is that she hung out with a bunch of communists, became a Catholic, and uh, really kind of left her mark on the Christian left. Yeah, for sure. I think that um, in, the, in the long Magnificast history, I think we've had some bad takes on Dorothy Day. Or maybe... Yeah, I think you're right. Maybe not on Dorothy Day specifically, but on the Catholic worker. Um, and listen, I think... Um, I don't know. When I was a child, I had childish takes. And now that I'm a man, I have man <laughs> takes. And it's that uh, it's good now. <laughs> and I was maybe wrong. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, yeah, there. That, I'll, I said it. It's good. We had a bad take and we're changing course here. <laughs> yeah, I agree. Um, they're still not communists, so, you know, whatever. But they're still also very cool. They can hang. They can hang. And, like, good. <laughs> yeah exactly there it is <laughs> that's the take i've got now all right well dean ease, ease <laughs> us into this trip let's talk about her trip to cuba and uh what she saw there sure uh so right before that she wrote a really interesting piece in the catholic worker just called about cuba uh, and it was some reflections that she had made alongside of a bunch of other reflections just trying to work out what the catholic worker could think about this revolution that was happening um in in cuba you know not far from florida 90 miles from the united states and they the catholic worker had gotten a lot of flack because they already seemed to be kind of sympathetic toward the revolutionary project and they were known for being pacifists which was already a sticky point for people who were watching people be sympathetic to an armed revolu revolution or revolt mm -hmm. um so that's one one part of it uh and secondly that like we said earlier they're not communists so that was also something that kind of rubbed certain readers of the Catholic worker the wrong way. And so she penned this little essay called About Cuba, trying to um, express her ideas. So this is before she went. Uh, and I'll read just like a couple pieces from it that she um, she writes. It's pretty, it's a wild little piece because she starts out kind of ambivalent and she confesses that she's having like a really, really hard time finding the right words and she wants to be very careful. <laughs> but by the end, by the time she gets to the very end of the uh, the whole piece, she ends up saying, uh, like, um, she says, God bless the priests and people of Cuba. God bless Castro and all those who are seeing Christ in the poor. <laughs> so, like, you know, she starts out pretty hesitant, but by the end, she's got a pretty resolute statement. Um, but one thing that I think is really fascinating is this quote here. She says, we are certainly not Marxist socialists, nor do we believe in violent revolution. Yet we do believe that it is better to revolt, to fight, as Castro did with his handful of men. He worked in the fields with the cane workers and thus gained them to his army, than to do nothing. We are on the side of the revolution. We believe that there must be new concepts of property which is proper to human beings, and that the new concept is not so new. There's a Christian communism and a Christian capitalism, as Peter Morin pointed out. And she goes on to list some other things in Cuba that she thinks are, are really good. Uh, but I think this is really fascinating to see Day trying to split some of the difference and find a, a nuanced way in which the Catholic worker can support the revolution sincerely, like saying that they're on the side of the revolution, uh, while also trying to be true to their own sort of idiosyncratic like, way of thinking and doing things. Yeah, honestly, I'm kind of floored by this because, um, I don't know, it's just like so much, so much nuance in a political position that is like, you know a little bit at odds with that of Cuba, but like still supportive. Uh, if nothing else, this is a, a really good demonstrative point of the ways that uh, the left ought to work together. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, that's right. It's cool though. It's just cool to see her kind of like go through this. And all, I mean, to like, you know, to really carefully talk out her reservations, but also just be like, yeah, but this is my side. So, okay. Right. If you go to the Catholic worker website um, and you just search Cuba, you're going to find a lot of different articles there. Um, the one that Dean read from is called, uh, about Cuba, you'll find one called More About Cuba, that's about after her trip, and then you'll, uh, the titles of all of her articles when she's actually there and kind of like writing about her experience are all called uh, Pilgrimage to Cuba 1, 2, 3, and 4. Um, so those are all written in 1962, um, and uh, I guess to, to contextualize it a little bit, um, let's see, if I remember history right, and I, I think I do, um, Batista <laughs> was outed in 1958, and then I think that the like uh, Castro's government was set up the following year. So she's only, you know, visiting like a little bit after the actual establishment of uh, Castro's government in Cuba. Um, so 
that's a good thing to keep in mind as we kind of talk through some of the things that she's seeing um, and can kind of contextualize the time period that she's talking from. Um, so the first part of the <laughs> the pilgrimage to Cuba is really it's really fun. I, like I was telling Dean before we started recording that like writing like this doesn't exist anymore and I hate it um, because it's just like basically like a travel like a travel blog about what she saw and like what she did and like kind of not just the exciting parts either but even like the really boring parts she talks about like going to this uh building to get her um you know to get like the the travel credentials and how many desks were in the building and um (laughs) how many people were sitting at the desks and like lots of stuff like that it's like very literary yeah for sure it is it's like like reading like a dostoevsky novel yeah (laughs) it is kind of similar to that um lots of details you didn't know you wanted to know about um but then uh <laughs> but then uh she gets on a boat and tells you all about the boat and she starts listing you listing out all of the rules on the boat and the boat when you're on the boat <laughs> it, you're under spanish law and that was a thing that stuck out to her <laughs> and she was this is really funny part where she's like describing the different rules and she's like and then rule 24 said that you couldn't have any firearms or munition after that, I stopped reading the rule book. It's like, oh yeah, <laughs> that makes sense. Okay, <laughs> um, yeah, and oh, she also did point out too that on the boat, since it was under Spanish rule, uh, uh, Franco. There's a picture of Franco on the boat, and she wasn't super into that, as one can imagine. Yeah, yeah. Um, Good take. Yeah, for sure. Uh, okay, so one of the first observations she has is um, just about, I guess, um, the presence of uh, the like of arms on the island. So she says this. Of course, I know that the island is an armed camp, that all the people make up the militia. It's too late now to talk of nonviolence. With one invasion behind them, and the threats of others ahead of them, and according to traditional Catholic teaching, the only kind uh, Fidel Castro ever had, the good Catholic is also the good soldier. Um, so, uh, and then the next, the next statement, she goes on to talk about how um, several of our old editors have accused us of giving up our pacifism. What nonsense, she says. So again, she's kind of like trying to walk this line between her like, you know, very real um, commitments to nonviolence and to pacifism and also uh, to being in a country that just won a revolution. And uh, it's good. It's an interesting tension to see her kind of walk. And I think that she does the the right thing and kind of like, I don't know, being up front that she's, you know, a, a vowed, uh, an avowed pacifist and not going to like change her ways, I guess. But also kind of like recognizing that uh, what they did in the situation was, I guess, you know, made sense. It was right. Yeah, it's really fascinating because it also presents uh, like a good nuanced pacifist perspective, too. Like we've talked about pacifism on this podcast a lot of times, probably too many times. Um, But the thing that always kind of grinds our gears about certain pacifists, not all of them, but certain ones, is that it becomes this sort of morally dogmatic stance that actually stops you from understanding the complex situations that oppressed people are in. And Dorothy Day is obviously not exhibiting that uh, kind of thing here. Um, Like, she seems to provide just a good example of how to be a pacifist and also understand the reality of the situations that people are in. Uh, You know, and she also goes on to say, like, according to traditional Catholic teaching, right, which is the teaching that Castro was raised in, he was educated by... Uh, ironically Francoist Jesuits um, that like her pacifism isn't the only position in that kind of Catholic teaching Um, and so people are negotiating things you know with the tools that they have so I think that's just a really good nice kind of exemplary point that you can be a pacifist and also recognize the complications of the situation yeah it's a good nuance to have one that I think is missing from I don't know the the sort of post-liberal um, pacifism of uh, Stanley Harwasser or whatever. Right. Yeah, I also love she says too in her kind of reflections throughout this uh, this first travel blog, you will. <laughs> she says, no one expects that Fidel will become another Martin of Tours or Ignatius and lay down his arms. But we pray the grace of God will grow in him and that with a better social order, grace will build on the good natural and that the church will be free to function, giving us the sacraments and the preaching and teaching of the man of peace, Jesus. And I also love that perspective, too, that, like, you know, okay, Fidel, probably not going to become a great exemplar of, like, Christian pacifism, but, like, who knows, maybe. Uh, but the the real thing that he could do is actually create a, a social order where perhaps uh, a, a message of peace would be more sustainable or more understandable or uh, more readily preached and accepted than it might have been in a time of, you know, brutal violence like it was for Batista. 
Yeah, uh, we've said this on our podcast before, and I'll say it again right now, I guess. But um, you kind of get the idea that um, living in a socialist country um, would make it a lot easier to be a Christian. <laughs> right. I don't know. I mean, like, uh, if if it's the case that, um, you know, as like the liberation theology folks want us to think uh, that like sin is more uh, communal than it is individual. Then, if you lived in a society that really tried to wrestle with like um, doing good sort of structurally, I don't know. It makes sense. Yeah, I think so. I think so. And it's nice too that she has this perspective of Fidel as somebody who uh, may not become a saint of nonviolence, but maybe morally exemplary in some other way. And there's no reason that Christians shouldn't sort of pray that he does. Like, why not hope that he succeeds? Yeah. I don't know. A good a good example of being an optimistic pacifist and also being like a realist about <laughs> situations. It's good. Yeah, that's right. Um, okay, so Dorothy Day, um, she talks a lot about. Well, I mean, in this first, uh, this first, tra- her, I'm just gonna call it her blog. It's her blog right now. Yeah. <laughs> uh, on Dorothy Day Zanga, she was like uh, just talking about all of the <laughs> places she really wanted to visit on the island, and um, they're interesting. I mean, I think that if I were to visit Cuba, I'd want to go see the same thing. She wants to go see the farms, like the co-ops. She wants to go see the schools, and like the state-run schools, like a big thing. She wants to see how religions negotiated within that space. She wants to see the churches and what's up there. And uh, in the next in the next part, we'll talk about it more, I guess, in a little bit. But she wants to go see Guantanamo Bay, which is very funny. Yeah, um, it's pretty wild. Yeah, So she, but she really is interested in, like, how religion is being negotiated on the island, right? Because, I mean, um, uh, in uh, the years following Batista, like, kicking Batista out, uh, Fidel and the other folks in charge of Cuba, uh, I mean, announced that, you know, it's a marxist Leninist country. And, like... Um, as we've talked about in other episodes too, you know, Marxist Leninist countries aren't super cool about religion a lot of times. So she's kind of like interested in that part and rightfully so. Um, so she wants to go see uh, the churches and if there are any churches being built and like what's going on there. And um, what she finds, as we'll see kind of in a few places throughout here, is that there are a bunch of Christians and Catholics and um, some of them are even communists. Uh, they're socialist nuns. So that's cool. Um, but she has this kind of interesting take on religion in Cuba. Um, where, uh, I think again, more of like a, an interesting, an interesting take where she's kind of negotiating her own sort of religious life, um, with regards to, I mean, a a good chunk of people who's, who've been, um, you know, um, probably crushed by religion in some ways. So she says this, um, if religion has so neglected the needs of the poor and of the great mass of workers and permitted them to live in the most horrible destitutions while comforting them with the solace of a promise of a life after death, when all tears should be wiped away then that religion is suspect. So Dorothy Day is someone who's, I mean, capable of expressing like lots of religious nuance and I mean, lots of ideological nuance. And this is good though, right? Like, I think this is kind of the, uh, a really good and critical stance. If it is the case that religion hasn't done the thing it's supposed to do, um, then uh, maybe we should be kind of suspicious, like religion for its own sake. Um, I mean, you know, religion is good, but uh, it has been used to like trample people. Yeah, and I mean, it's interesting because she also says in her About Cuba, the kind of pre-travel reflections that persecution is the kind of thing that sometimes is earned and sometimes is not. And she's open to that. Like, she's open to the possibility that maybe the church is on the wrong side. And she kind of laments that, like, sometimes the Catholic worker is on the side of the people that persecute the church. And that's like a really uncomfortable position to be in, but it's the one that sometimes they're forced into. And I think that's also a really wild thing, too, because like a lot of people will uh, narrate Dorothy Day as the I mean, she's going to be a saint. Right. So they'll narrate her as this like um, oh, she's like thoroughly Catholic and just always cool with the church. And her voice is basically to, you know, preach the Catholic doctrine into like the the spheres of the left or something like that. Um, and surely there's part of that that's true but she's also like uh severely critical of her own christian tradition by virtue of her contact with the left i think uh and that helps to i guess complicate her as an individual a little bit um and it comes to the fore in cuba when she's forced to like wrestle with all those questions at once yeah uh as it turns out dorothy day is a real live person (laughs) (laughs) wow (laughs) um all right so let's talk about her second dispatch um this one's really interesting because she goes around listening to a ton of speeches uh speeches by fidel and che and raul castro and and others she's like really wants to hear what they have to say 
And it's really fun because she provides a transcript from a speech that Fidel gives about how you could be a Christian in the revolution. She thinks that's like really exciting and even surprising to her. Uh, But my favorite thing is she her attitude toward Fidel really comes through in this. And she obviously admires him a lot. Uh, And what's great is like she reports on the content of what he says every once in a while. But the big thing is like the form and how he delivers things. And she seems to sense this like kindred spirit. Uh, So she says, uh, for example, after talking about the speech, um, like all people with enthusiasm, Fidel tends to have or tends to the kind of happy fervor we at the Catholic Worker are well used to. And then she goes on to say, will it be shocking to our readers to learn that as I heard him speak three other times, the sound of his voice, his manner of oratory, his constant repetitions reminded me of Peter Morin, which is pretty high praise. <laughs> like You can't really be uh, uh, better in the good books of Dorothy Day than Peter Morin, I think. Um, and so to sort of view Fidel as this really like jovial, happy revolutionary who shares this kind of spirit with the Catholic worker, I think is just a really fascinating presentation of him as a person. Yeah, I think so. Um, so, Dean, this is uh, no surprise to you. Um, but I've never met Fidel Castro in real life. Oh, that's uh, weird. I know, right? You might expect that uh, he and I, uh, like he knows my PlayStation gamer tag, but he doesn't. <laughs> I never met him, unfortunately, I guess. Uh, I've watched a lot of like, uh, I've, I think I've watched maybe all of the Cuba documentaries in my life. And th- something, <laughs> when I read this thing about Fidel and his um, happy fervor, I thought like, yeah, that sounds exactly right to me based on everything I've ever seen about him. In every documentary, he's constantly hugging people. Like every yeah. time he meets somebody, he's just like he's just a he's just a real hugger. Um, yeah, he's real smiley too. Yeah, he's really smiley. He's all hug. He's just got a lot of got a lot of hugs in him. So <laughs> I don't know. I, that's what I gotta say about that man. He hug that Fidel is a guy that likes to hug. It's true. Uh, he also likes to play basketball. I really like that that video. Oh yeah, <laughs> that's pretty good. Um, yeah. So there you go. Uh, turns out Fidel Castro. Two is a real life person, huh? <laughs> okay. Um, the next point I want to make is not one that has anything to do with Christianity, uh, but it was an observation that Dorothy Day had that I really liked. <laughs> I don't know why it just seemed like so funny <laughs> um, and so interesting. Uh, so she was talking about. Uh, so she in this like second sort of dispatch of her uh, live journal, she is talking about her time in Havana and like what it was like to stay there. Um, and she says that she stayed in this, like, hotel. It used to be the red light district, but they had closed it down and, like, nationalized the hotels. Um, so she says this. All hotels have been nationalized and the price is set. Rooms are hard to get since many hotels are occupied by students and couples coming in from the provinces on their vacations, which are compulsory one month a year. I just really <laughs> like this idea because right now I'm in the thick of a very busy sort of semester. And I wish I had a compulsory one month <laughs> vacation that someone forced me to take um yeah I like i like that idea i don't know just like a small glimpse into like a different world where people have to take compulsory one month vacations and stay in a hotel somewhere pretty good yeah, i'm i'm a student and part of a couple so i think that means two months yeah that's true i think that's how it works it's those things stack <laughs> yeah uh that is great though i mean it, it, this is just echoing a point you made earlier but it's actually really nice how she's she draws you into like the daily life of Cuba. Yeah. Uh, it's not just like a series of judgments or observations about the society. It's like trying to make Cuba come alive for people who are reading it and make it, you know, it, it's like an important service because as a person in the United States, you're not supposed to even be going there in the first place. So she's trying to present a real kind of like humanistic personalized view of what it means to to lead a life in cuba for people that otherwise are being told from their government that like these people are monsters that they're all suffering and slaving away or something yeah (laughs) there's even one reflection where she's like i was on the bus and i didn't know where to go and everyone kept trying to help me find where i was supposed to go and they didn't really do it and then the bus driver wanted to buy my radio from me and it's like this whole weird story (laughs) (laughs) okay yeah yeah (laughs) okay um Cool. So that is, uh, yeah, her blog post number two about Cuba. And the third one, um, it's more observations um, about uh, places she goes and um, more reflections on, I think, like the overall sort of feel of Cuba. Um, Okay. Uh, So uh, I mentioned a few minutes ago that the first place that she said she wanted to go was Guantanamo Bay, like the naval base there that the United States occupies and still does occupy, if you forgot. Um, you probably didn't forget. Thanks, Obama. Uh, yeah, thanks for not closing it down, Obama. Oh my gosh. 
Um, still mad about that, actually. I think everyone should be. Uh, yeah. Okay, sorry, one quick plug. Guantanamo Bay is a, like a horrific place, and it should be shut down immediately. And if you don't know about it, go look it up. Okay, so uh, Dorothy Day wants to go there. Um, so she says this. I said I should like to go and see Guantanamo Naval Base uh, just to stand there and look at it. The Hong Kong of Cuba. And then I said I should like to write to President John Kennedy and ask him to voluntarily relinquish it as a great and <laughs> unprecedented gesture of goodwill, which would have tremendous moral effect on the entire world. Of course, he would be impeached at once, but such a mad gesture would not be without its effect. <laughs> I like this reflection because it's just like she knows that this is like, you know, jacked up and she wants to do She just, you know, is kind of having some fun with it. Um, and I appreciate that. I appreciate that nod uh, towards U.S. imperialism her recognition of it and that she wants to write this letter even even if it wouldn't if, even if it didn't ever happen it doesn't matter it's just fun yes yeah. it's, it's it fun. is a nice uh like speculative fantasy though like imagine if he had and then did get impeached and then like the whole world had to be like wait so you're not gonna put it back though right <laughs> yeah exactly uh the man in the high castle but it's just that <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> um the man, the man in the high castle but it's just like pretty positive <laughs> everyone just feels a little <laughs> yeah. bit better about themselves <laughs> uh yeah that's good um so a few other things that happen in this particular uh entry in her, her travel diary is uh she talks to a bunch of catholics about their experience and surprised she finds that some of them don't really like the changes and what's interesting is she tries to give them some advice to about like how to negotiate it and the advice is basically like, I don't know, maybe just like don't foment revolution, like recognize that you're in like a difficult situation if you're like trying to raise a Catholic family and just like try to figure out a way to reconcile with the society that you live in now. It's like a really interesting take. Um, she doesn't really like encourage them to fully endorse the revolution or something like that, um, but she also doesn't uh, try to stoke any like hopes of you know a change or like going back to the way that things used to be and i think that's a really kind of neat thing um some of the advice that she gives specifically is pretty bad <laughs> but uh the attitude i guess like her heart's in the right place anyway so yeah some of the catholic folks she met there uh were not super thrilled about communism <laughs> um and okay uh, however, she did find some uh, some Catholics who were actually pretty okay with it. Uh, so uh, in uh, she took a trip to Santiago de Cuba, and she um, met uh, Sister Mercedes, who's kind of just like, a char- I guess, a character in the story. I don't know. She doesn't say much else about her. Um, but she says, I found Sister Mercedes, one of the social service sisters, who was as serene and calm as though it were the most natural thing in the world to live under a Marxist-Leninist government, proudly calling herself a socialist. Um, so, okay, um, there were some people who were critical, and then there were some people who were, you know, pretty okay with it. Yeah, I dig it. Um, she also goes on to kind of, like, try to explain some of the, what she thinks are, like, the motives behind it, which kind of, uh, illuminates the Sister Mercedes story a bit, too. So she says, uh, I'm gonna try not to be the occasion of sin for our opponents in the future. Which means I will try and try again to think things out, study, read more, find more authorities for our position stimulate others to that same study and so express myself that I will evoke in others what is really there to be evoked a desire to do what is right to follow conscience to love one's brother and to find what is there of God in every man and you just kind of get this impression that like she thinks that people are actually genuinely trying to figure things out here and her approach to that as like a person now building these relationships is that she's going to try to like really figure out how to have like meaningful conversations rather than uh create like problems uh one way or the other um and that's like she doesn't want to create problems for like both sides like both for the sort of cuban authorities that she may or may not agree with sometimes or for like the people uh in cuban society that she may or may not agree with like she sort of just feels like this big responsibility to to present a a good case a reasonable case in the hopes that like people could really figure this out together yeah it's a, a good faith approach yeah okay well um, maybe we can kind of close out uh, section three of uh, her trip to Cuba with this like other quick kind of note. Uh, we don't have to spend very much time on it before we get to the next part. But uh, she uh, she notes that there's like this phrase that she keeps seeing around Cuba and one I actually hadn't seen before, which maybe just reveals how much I don't know about uh, post-revolutionary Cuba. But um, she says that she keeps seeing this phrase around sort of like a, as part of like the 
you know, the propaganda, I suppose. Uh, and the quote is, children are made to be happy. And that's sort of like one of like the slogans of the revolution. And then she, uh, she says, but St. Thomas says that all men are meant for happiness. It was good to see so much of it around. <laughs> and that's like, <laughs> that's her reflection. I think that she mentions, uh, like Fidel says that, but also she, she sees it like on signage and stuff. Um, yeah, yeah. It's a nice, it's a nice one though. Children are made to be happy. Hell yeah, dude. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Love uh... it. <laughs> It's weird to read this now, I think, just because, like, I've been reading these journals uh, a few times just in the past several months, uh, and along with some other Christian reflections on Cuba, like Ernesto Cardinal's, just trying to think of, like, what Christians made of that whole situation. And when you read those kinds of travel dispatches, it's actually, like, it's really encouraging, but it's also kind of, I don't really know the word for it, like, it's also kind of sad in a way, because everything they describe is so like beautiful and amazing. (laughs) And uh, like the fact that that kind of society wasn't allowed to just sort of like flourish on its own is so tragic and like really heartbreaking in a weird way. It's like, I don't know, like the happier the situation feels, the more tragic it actually ends up being. Like it reads like you're reading a kind of crazy, like fantasy utopia or something like that uh, written by people who, you know, are not like, diehard ideologues who are like designed to uh, support the project or whatever they're just reporting what they see and it turns out they just see a bunch of people being really happy and uh, I don't know I don't really know what to do with that like emotive response but it's just one that I often hear when I read lines like that or yeah. often feel when I hear lines like that yeah I think that you're right I mean like I don't know all you have to do to kind of see like how discordant this description of Cuba is with like the way that we live our lives every day in the United States or even in Canada is like, what, what if for a second, like um, the entirety of the organ, like the entirety of the country was organized around the idea that children should be happy. Right. <laughs> and like, no, that's like radically different. Like um, that's, that's not the, that's not how we organize our society. Children are made to be like obedient. Uh, children are made to be, um, you know, uh, good workers in the future or something they're they should be sort of like disciplined when they should be disciplined or whatever right um just like it's a it's completely different way of thinking about the world or even just think about right. like if that was the type of like state-sponsored propaganda you saw it's right. so <laughs> different like i don't know the thing the the most like children-centric content i see are usually like fast food menus and not about like the happiness <laughs> um <laughs> So but they're called happy meals. So. They're called happy meals. Children are made to eat happy meals. Um, meals are made to be happy. Meals are made to be happy. Children are made to eat them. So, <laughs> uh, that's too bad, but true. This is making me really sad. We need to do something different. <laughs> yeah. All right. We got to move on. All right. We're let's bring it back around. Let's just start talking about how good Cuba is again. Okay. Yeah, um, let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> so let's, let's live vicariously <laughs> through Dorothy Day and think yeah. about how awesome this would be. <laughs> Exactly. This is like this is like reading a, I don't know, some like very trashy like escapist science fiction novel for me. I feel like. <laughs> um, so <laughs> she goes on uh, in the fourth uh, her fourth blog post to say Fidel and the Cuban people seem to know each other inside and out. The people here are prepared to die for their revolution, with or without help from the USSR, and that comes after some kind of disagreements that. Uh, Fidel was having with Khrushchev publicly on TV and uh, I just think that sort of way of putting it is so fascinating that Fidel and the Cuban people seem to know each other inside and out it just reminds me of when we were talking about Paulo Ferreira and Pedagogy of the Oppressed a long time ago um, that for Ferreira like the success of critical pedagogy and revolutionary movements themselves depends on this sort of mediating tissue between the revolution and the people where Mm -hmm. there's this mutual exchange uh, of energy and ideas and people are, are working together and it's not the revolution just dictating what's going on and it's also not the people just kind of like accepting passively what what's happening in one direction or the other but it's this kind of mutual process of like co-emergence and the fact that she sort of names that in a sentence i think is just really like powerful and a, a really interesting observation for someone like dorothy day to have yeah i think so i mean it's like um I, I mean, it should it should be less surprising than it is, I guess. But like putting it in that way is like pretty interesting. Um, I mean, the whole point of the revolution and you know to have a Marxist Leninist society is to is to you know mold the population into like an actual coherent class. And um, maybe that's what this means that they knew each other inside and out. They were they were an actual class of people that um, you know existed. Yeah, crazy. 
crazy that that could happen. <laughs> yeah, super crazy. She has lots of other reflections that kind of like um mirror this insight. There's this whole thing that she has about how like um no one in Cuba is like drunk, which is weird. Yeah. Actually, and then there's <laughs> this other insight where she's like, um, one time I saw somebody, uh, the guy I was traveling with, he um he left his wallet on the bus and nobody took it. And look at they're also honest and like well okay. But whatever, uh, it's just, you know, she's 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 drawing these things out and like trying to characterize a people, which is uh, troublesome sometimes. But um, she's doing it again, I think, in good faith. Yeah, what you're just saying about uh, the the people, society, or whatever, I think is really interesting. And I think what's especially fascinating is she's trying to work out how these people function in a Marxist Leninist state, and she it's crazy because she would prefer probably that they like were not Marxist Leninists. She would prefer that the state isn't Marxist Leninist. Um, but she wants to sort of lob that dissent in a really interesting way. Uh so like she doesn't want those people who are already really honest or whatever and like wouldn't steal your wallet to like all of a sudden start like a counter-revolution or something like that. Instead, she says, uh, the Catholic, the Christian must outdo in zeal, in self-sacrifice, in dedication, in service for the common good, those who are following the teachings of Marxism and Leninism. I think this is a really interesting point. I mean, I like personally, I don't think the opposition has to be there. I think that she's sort of like unnecessarily upset about Marxism Leninism a lot of the time. Uh, I don't know exactly why that is. It sometimes feels to me like a willfully strong misreading. But uh, in any case, if you have to disagree with Marxism Leninism, uh, then you should definitely disagree on the grounds that like you want to be better at making a good society, and that's how you would like prove it. Like you would prove it in your actions, not in like trying to overthrow the government or something like that i think that's at least like an interesting take yeah um i'll take it <laughs> um i don't know i don't know what her objections to marxism leninism are specifically i mean i can kind of take some guesses i suppose um but yeah that's that's that is you're right an interesting way to dissent uh just be better at it than them <laughs> be better at communism than the communists you know yeah exactly it's a good take. I like it. I think it's fine. Good luck. More power to you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. Uh, it's better than yeah all the op- uh, all the other uh, options you could pick. Um, yeah. Okay, so uh, in so far, uh, Dorothy Day is overwhelmingly positive about Cuba, and so are we. And we're probably reading her even you know as more strongly positive than maybe she even was. Who knows? <laughs> um, and we did at one point say that reading this is kind of like a dystopian novel of how good things could be. Dorothy Day does make uh, some some provisions, I guess, about some of the things she says. So um, she kind of poses the question uh, because, she, you know, she knows she's going to get uh, some haters or whatever. One of our readers and a very dear friend asked me after I came home, is there no criticism you can make about Cuba? Is everything so wonderful there? Cannot you find anything against it? And Dorothy Day makes a few um, a few comments about, um, you know, what she might find against it. She says, life is not easy in Cuba these days, and the people are undergoing great hardships in every way. They're getting enough food to survive, but certainly not the kind of food they wish. There's this whole thing um, earlier on where she keeps talking about the um, the USSR and China are sending them canned meat. And yeah, sounds bad. Uh, but, <laughs> I, uh, like, yuck. But there is... Canned uh, communist meat does sound very bad. Yeah, yeah. But there is just the same widespread efforts towards health and education and work for all. And the crisis has united the people so that there are not the problems of delinquency and violence, drug and drink addiction, lack of work for the older and younger members of the community, and so on. Trying to find something against it is that, like, listen, they're in a bad situation. They like, literally just had a revolution. Um, and there are harsh, um, you know, there's uh, an invasion planned against them. Uh, a, a country, you know, uh, tried to overthrow uh, <laughs> Castro, uh, the country of the United States. Spoiler alert, in case you haven't got there yet <laughs> in your life. <laughs> um, but like, yeah, she's being real about it. I don't know. There are problems. Um, she mentions a few times about the type of like the, the problems with, like food and um, and like the um, rations that people get. And I don't know. She's not being unrealistic, I think, even in any of this. She's being pretty upfront about it. Um, of course, like, okay, so she's writing these, um, these travel logs in, like, 1962, and if you know anything about the history of Cuba, you do know that things do get worse, uh, for Cuba, um, because of, uh, more and more sanctions, uh, against them by the United States and the whole, uh, 
embargo. Um, but uh, what she's seeing, I think, is is right. I don't think she's being dishonest when she's saying everything that's right about Cuba. Yeah, and I mean, she also says that despite it's not the food that they might want to have, like people aren't starving there, which is very important because she says that like the government in the U.S. says that they are, and she's like, that's just not true. Yeah. Um. So that's very good and useful uh but it's funny that like (laughs) she basically was like yeah i I guess there's some problems (laughs) like she you know she doesn't there's no two ways about it like she uh she certainly is trying her best to like depict the society but what she keeps finding is that it's encouraging even in its hardships like there's a couple other places where she talks about some struggles people have in like the countryside like they might not have electricity or like access to certain like accoutrements or whatever, but she kind of sees all those situations and it seems like the people she talks to also see them this way as opportunities for people to just keep on building stuff together. Uh, Like they seem to pose problems that give people something to do and like common project or common task, uh, which I think is really fascinating. It reminds me of in Ernesto Cardinal's reflections on being in Cuba. Uh, He's like talking to somebody on the street and he asks them, do you ever feel like um, like there's not freedom of speech or like that you're afraid to to say something? And this one guy is like, well, um, actually, we're just afraid that people won't perceive that we're revolutionaries. And Cardinal's like, oh, because they'll like put you in prison. He's like, no, because we are revolutionaries. And like, we don't want people to like not think that we are. So like, it's very important that we express that we are. <laughs> it's like the funniest conversation in the world. Um, but it just kind of reminds me of that, you know, that uh, the problems themselves pose like an opportunity for sort of solidarity or something. Yeah. <laughs> it's just that people won't think we are cool, as cool as we actually are, you know? That's yeah, important. exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, overall, I mean, Okay, this is like a weird glimpse of a weird snapshot of 1962 Cuba. Um, but it is really interesting, I think, in a lot of accounts because it expresses Dorothy Day's kind of like very careful and good faith interaction with um, people who she, I think, feels allied with, but does not like, uh, you know, find complete unity with. And I really like that about this article. It's kind of a, a really nuanced, oh, I mean, for her writings, it's a it's a really nuanced sort of position. And I think it's just a really nuanced position for, like, people in uh, 2019 to really think about, too, as, you know, as we kind of navigate the tumultuous waters of leftism uh, and uh, people who post about it, I guess. But uh, that's why I like this piece, at least. Uh, what do you think, Dean? Yeah, no, I think that's what continues to stick out for me as well. Like, it's just a good example of, how to affirm a revolutionary project that is different from yours uh, and also find your own way of, um, if you have to be critical of it, being critical of it in the right way, like in a way that doesn't undermine it, but actually kind of furthers its goal in a certain sense. Um, That seems to be her strategy, you know, like if you wish everyone was actually Catholic instead of Marxist-Leninist, then you should just like be a really, really good person then. And uh, hopefully that will, you know, make a mark. Um, and I think that's a really important lesson as well that, uh, especially in light of all, all manners of sectarianism on the left, that like, if you're upset that, you know, communists or anarchists or other sort of lefty types are are getting somewhere, like maybe think twice about that and like try to figure out how you could, uh, help push those projects in a healthy and helpful direction or something. Yeah, I'll take it. It's a lesson we, we need, I think. Yeah. On the on the night of the State of the Union address, <laughs> the stank of the onion address. The stank of the onion. It was a cold and stanky night. Uh, sh- in this uh, in the stank of the onion fan fiction, uh, Shrek is the president. <laughs> uh, yeah, and uh, it's too bad because he's always like, "No, this is my swamp," and he's trying to build that big wall. So there's a lot of metaphors there. You're already handing like. You're you're just preparing us all to replace uh, Harry Potter with Shrek, and I'm actually not sure about that. Yeah, I think it makes a lot. Uh, Shrek is sort of like the political meta narrative. Uh, makes a lot more sense to me than Harry Potter. It's more. I think it's more of the meta narrative we deserve, and it makes more sense. It's true. Trump is more of a Farquaad figure than he is a Voldemort figure. That's true. Okay, and Mike Pence is the hmm, dragon. He's those. He's those little uh those little guys that like uh 
when they get to Duloc, they push the button and they all dance around and they, they almost swear and then they don't. That's my sense. That's right. Yep. Watch your face. That is... <laughs> you did it. Uh, I don't know. Is Bernie Sanders Shrek in this situation? I don't know, man. Um, uh, it's hard to say. He might be. Uh, only time will tell. We'll have to sort of see uh, what the uh, material conditions of the moment give us for the figure of Shrek in this grand new political <laughs> meta narrative we have. What we need is a Shrek. What we need is a new Shrek, a doubtless very different Shrek. We need to kick these Harry Potters out of here, and we need one good, strong Shrek. <laughs> one good, good, strong President Shrek and Vice President Donkey. Hey, this, 2020. Po- this podcast took a real weird turn here at the end, and. Um, you know what? No. Uh, since I'm a communist again, I'm going to just su- kind of suppress our own ideas here because I think they're too challenging <laughs> for even the people that listen to this podcast. Yeah, probably. That sounds right to me. Uh, we'll record a, a whole Patreon of our Shrek, Fre- Shrek uh, fan fiction. <laughs> oh, boy. Thanks for listening to the Magnificast. If you like this episode, and I <laughs> definitely know you did, and all of its good Shrek-related content... Uh, you can subscribe and support us, support us on Patreon, patreon.com slash The Magnificast. You can also follow us on Twitter, um, also just at The Magnificast. And uh, yeah, find our stuff there. Dean, what else should we say? Uh, you can send us your questions for the 100th episode, which is next week. Um, send us some theology questions to our email at themagnificast at gmail.com. Also, uh, be on the lookout for news regarding Brenna and her comrades. Um, we're going to post some more stuff as we hear about it. And what things you can do to help uh, today on on whatever day it is Tuesday, uh, people are like calling the jail and on her behalf. Um, we don't really know what that situation is going to look like by the time Friday rolls around, obviously, but we'll keep people posted. And uh, yeah, I think that is about it. Yeah, well, thanks to Amari Armstrong for our intro music and thanks to Theological Spoon for our outro music. And uh, next episode is the big 100. So we'll uh, see you Shrek time. Oh, nice for the Shrek Nificast. I don't want to get up for church in the morning, church in the morning, souls alive. Heaven come to earth and there won't be no church. We'll meet down by the riverside. There we'll swim with all creation. Never get tired, never bored. Don't worry, someday there'll be no dam between us and our Lord. Jackson, you keep your hoods up. You keep your hoods up and you stay up late. Jackson, you keep your hoods up. Where you keep your hoods up